Today, I'm joined by the co-founder of cult favorite brand Urban Decay and now her clean makeup brand, Kali Ray. Stay tuned for a chat on what goes into creating a cosmetics brand with sustainability factor and what's coming next for the brand. Hi everyone and welcome to The Founded Beauty, a podcast dedicated to beauty entrepreneurs who built some of the biggest brands today and where we learn exactly how they did it. We'll cover some of the most intimate stories, their path to success, and how they overcame the obstacles along the way. I'm Akash Mehta, CEO and co-founder of Fable and Main, a modern hair wellness brand inspired by ancient Indian beauty secrets. Building Fable and Main has been an incredible journey so far, and I've decided to launch this podcast as a founder keen to learn and connect with fellow beauty brand founders around the world. I believe in collaboration over competition, and so I'm using this platform as a way to hopefully help and inspire each other in what can be quite a tough and lonely journey. So if you are an entrepreneur or simply just curious how to build a brand, this podcast is perfect for you. So without further ado, it's a delight to welcome our guest for today, Wendy Zomno. As a co-founder of one of the industry's favorite makeup brands, Urban Decay, beauty lovers everywhere were delighted to discover when earlier this year, Wendy launched her new brand, Kali Ray. A brand to watch, Kali Ray is the perfect concoction of beauty and wellness in a clean makeup line. It was inspired by the SoCal lifestyle, highlighting low-key effortless looks while reimagining a bold love letter to California through its aesthetic. From its vibrant sunset-inspired packaging and close focus on sustainable standards, Wendy has truly done it again and created an incredible brand with an energy and purpose that is unmatched. I also love that she is a self-professed fan of the creative process. Starting from zero is no easy thing, but if there's one thing that Wendy knows, it's how to build a makeup brand. So I'm so excited to sit down with her today. So Wendy, thank you for being with us. Oh, I'm so excited to be here with you and everyone else. So the first question I ask, all my guests, I'm going to ask you, is who in a nutshell is Wendy? Oh. That's such a hard question. I, I think more than it, because I have a lot of roles, like all of us, right? I have so many roles. And so which one do you pick first? I think I have to pick mom first. Love that. Probably not for much longer, but I've gotten to be a mom for not only my own children, but also so many people that worked for me mm. and to my brands. So I feel like I'm a nurturer and uh, like, I love to build people up and brands up and like, nurture. So I would Love say that. I'm a mom and, um, I'm a little bit of a secret rebel mm -hmm. because my brands are always like pushing the envelope in terms of tone and the kinds of things we're doing. And, um, I'm, but I'm really in real life. I'm kind of a people pleaser. You can see, I don't have crazy colored hair, any tattoos. So I don't really like outwardly rebel, but I like have my little inward rebellion. Oh, I love that. So, okay, so let's go to the beginning. So you, where you were born and raised, was it in Texas or? I was. I was born in Laredo, Texas, right on the Laredo, border. Texas. And yep. um, yes, I was born and raised there. And then I ended up going to high school in Brussels, Belgium, actually Waterloo, Belgium. You've heard of the Battle Whoa. of Waterloo? Yeah, yeah. I, was, I went to high school in Waterloo. And then Amazing. after high school, I went back to Texas for college and then started my career from there. So what were some of the, the initial, I guess, um, first experiences with beauty growing up in, in Texas, but you know, in your home? Did you start playing with makeup brushes from a young age? And tell us about that. Yeah. So I can remember when I was little going into my mom's makeup drawer and mm. I remember the smell of it more than anything else, more than the specific things that are in there that smell of the, like the oils that have gone slightly bad, you know, because they don't have the preservative yeah. systems we have today. Like that would be completely unaccept unacceptable, unacceptable for my products or your products. <laughs> yeah. But it had this smell to it. And I remember thinking things like, why does my mom put on that brown stuff on her face, like foundation? Um, but I quickly fell in love with makeup and my mom didn't have a great makeup drawer. She's a pretty natural applier of makeup. But I remember when I was 13, she took me to her, uh, to a Merle Norman store and got me a little pot of, uh, like sheer foundation. And she said, it's really important you wear this because I grew up on a cotton farm and she had all of these brothers and sisters, she had 12 brothers and sisters, seven sisters, and they would be outside all day picking cotton. And she said, we all glammed it up to go pick cotton. We all wore our makeup. 
And the girls at the farm next door never wore any makeup, and their skin looked really bad. So this was before people were talking about sunscreen, sunscreen, sunscreen. My mom had somehow figured out that if you put at least something on your face, right, it probably had a ton of titanium dioxide in it, this, like, old school, like, pot of makeup. And um, she's like, you gotta, you got to wear makeup and protect your skin. So, um, that was kind of my first, like, start into makeup, and then I got really into the eyeshadow stuff. I, so, I started getting, mm. like, I was at a friend's house, and she had a Seventeen magazine. I was really excited about that, and I started, like, looking at the pictures of the models, and there was Brooke Shields, and she just had this amazing eye makeup on. So, I would tear out her pictures and put them on my mirror in my bathroom and then my mom also gave me a big, like, case of makeup, like one of those really cheap ones um, yep. that they have at holiday time. And I would sit there and recreate the looks. And I really fell in love with doing my eyes. Like, I loved yeah. putting eye makeup on. And I loved it so much that when I was 13, in eighth grade, I got sent home from school for wearing too much makeup. And you have to remember, this isn't like some normal place. This is Texas. You know how hard it is to get sent home from school for wearing too much makeup in Texas? <laughs> um, pretty hard. So that was kind of, you know, my first love affair with makeup was right when I was about 13. And when I realized that makeup really was this whole idea of self-expression, hmm. when I was about 16 or 17, I was coming out of church and the priest kind of sought me out and he said, you know, I really think you're hiding behind that mask of makeup and you need to come to terms with yourself. And I thought to myself, you have it all wrong. I'm actually not hiding anything. I'm showing you all of it. Like I'm showing you how I feel today. I'm showing you all of it. And that was really how I always viewed makeup was it was a tool to sort of like express whatever I was feeling. And that's really sort of the genesis of Urban Decay was, you know, back in the mid 90s. I mean, this was probably way before your time, but the makeup world wasn't this like technicolor dream it is today. It was kind of like a sad place, actually. Um, yeah. You know, prestige makeup was all like pink and beige and red. It was kind of boring. And so you could get color, but it was at the drugstore and it was kind of poor quality. They didn't really like take people seriously if they wanted to wear brightly colored eyeshadow, I guess. So, um, I just felt like makeup was more about aspiring to look like someone you would never be. Right. Mm, I was never going to be so like true. the skinny blonde, blue eyed, even featured perfect girl that was on every single makeup ad. And mm. I felt like makeup marketing was more about like pushing you at that time. It was about pushing you to like feel a little bad about yourself so that you'd buy their products so that maybe possibly you could look a tiny bit more like her. And I thought that that wasn't right. You know, like we should all be about expressing ourselves. And I'm super stoked because today that's kind of table stakes with the makeup brand, right? Exactly. So if we change the world just a little bit, it's a good thing. But when we launched Urban, it was about... You know, we we actually said our very first brand statement was makeup for girls and boys. Wow. Yeah. That's in 1995, right? So this is yeah. at a time where... 1995. Is, yeah, we have to and, remember. Because people say people today would be like, oh, yeah, that's normal. But it's like, no, this is 1995 when the industry wasn't really where it is at all today. Not at all. Um, and we said it was makeup for girls and boys who want to show who the world who they are and put their own stamp on it. So it's mm -hmm. really about that. We go to these trade shows because there was no Sephora. Yeah. And we would, like, sell to these little boutiques. And I remember, like, I would get the Teamsters that would set up your booth at the trade show. And mm -hmm. I would get them and I would paint their nails. Like, I could get guys. I was like, I'm going to start and get guys. And so just this, I just had kooky ideas about makeup. But it all ended up working out. So, I mean, so 1975 urban decay launched but how many like was it a year or two in the making and how did you you know gather the um, your, your co-founders you had how did you all come together it's a really interesting story so it actually wasn't my idea and this is a really like i know you were talking at the beginning about how your podcast is about mentorship and helping mm -hmm. each other and all of that 
And this is a, such a good example of that. And it didn't really exist at the time. Um, I was actually on the Beauty Independent um, Awards thing. I got the Industry Icon Award, which I was very excited about. But the first thing yeah. I said was, you know, I really wish we had had a resource like Beauty Independent, this like community, right? Yeah. That like supports then, each other yeah. and helps. That's why I'm super excited to talk to you today because I think community is so important and helping so. each other is so important. But I met this woman through one of my best friends who is still one of my best friends. And um, her name was Sandy Lerner. She founded Cisco Systems. She's yep. brilliant, brilliant, st- PhD statistician at Stanford, you know. Yep. And um, she and her husband, Len, invented the router. They started Cisco like crazy, crazy. I'm this girl from Texas whose dad worked for a corporate, you know, he worked for the military and then corporations. And so to me, it wasn't, I, I always knew I wanted to have my own business, but I never really had anyone to model how to go about that or that you could break an industry. And Sandy had done all of those things and we really connected. And she was like, I broke tech. Like what's makeup? Like Mm -hmm. easy, you know, baby games. So, um, Sandy was just like, yeah, let's go break it. Let's go break down the cosmetics department door. And I was like, I'm in. Like, I would have never thought to do that on my own. It took someone else to say, I see it in you. And let's do this together. And I'm going to help you. And I'm going to show you, like, it doesn't matter how big the company is. There's always a crack. And you can always find your way in. Right? Yep. That's such a good point. So that's really how it got off the ground. I, and it, and it's so funny how sometimes it takes some people, you know, others around you to see your own potential. Um, and you need that sometimes that push. And I, I do believe there's a lot of brands out there that are founded by one person. I think that's incredible. But um, I'm so grateful to have my sister because she brings out the best of me. She gives me the opportunities to shine. So co-founding it is sometimes also a good gateway for people to get into the industry when they need to people around you because it can be very, very lonely. So yeah, did you I find mean, at the beginning? Yeah. Did, did, did I was just going to with Kelly Ray. I have Jenna. She and I met exactly. playing beach football like and yeah. we, we just like muse off each other, you know? Like, I think that's a really, really interesting point because you co-founded a brand with other people. And then when you went to create your next brand, you know, some people could say, well, I'm, I'm creating this on my own now. Right. But you still decided I actually, I'm choosing to co-found it with someone else as well, which is amazing. Well, Yeah, eventually you create these, you know, with Urban Decay, the cool thing was when we were at, you know, like Hmm. when we were sort of rock star legend status, we were a big family. Like that was the cool thing. You know, it wasn't about like, oh, you know, you're this level and I'm this level. It was really about being this like family and doing things together. And like we said at the beginning, like it's all about community and one of my, That's I right, think, I biggest achievements isn't like, oh, I sold all these naked palettes or I did this or I won this award or whatever. The biggest achievement is that we built a business, I with mm. other people, right, built a business that employed people. They had good jobs. They could buy houses and cars and provide for their families and be creatively fulfilled. Like yeah. that to me That's, is the biggest that, thing. I mean, that is... Uh, you, we become the beneficiary as founders when you can give that joy to people. We get the joy in tenfold back, you know? Yes. It's exactly that. And I love that. So, so I would love to know a little bit about how the name Urban Decay came to be. Like, how did you guys decide on the name? So we always knew it was going to be urban something, urban something. And Sandy's husband, who's a computer scientist, said, oh, call it Urban Decay. And it and it, we just kind of, it kind of stuck. It and stuck. um I remember thinking, well, we can't call a makeup brand Urban Decay. Like, there's no <laughs> way. <laughs> and But then I was in New York, and I was walking down the streets of New York, and I saw, like, these rusting fire escapes and crumbling brick buildings. And I kept thinking about, like, all the co- how beautiful that was because of all the cool stories that, like, crumbling brick building probably had to tell. Mm-hmm. And I had lived in this loft in Chicago before I moved to California and met Sandy. And it was an illegal loft building. We had 4,000 square feet. We were not. We were squatting. Absolutely not supposed to be. Not squatting. We were paying rent. But it was supposed to be yeah. a business, right? Yeah. And the building was this really cool old building that had all this history. And I went and actually researched all the history. It turns out, like, Frank Sinatra used to hang out in the penthouse area when he was in uh... Chicago. And, like, there's all this, like, cool stuff that happened there. And I wrote a story about it because I was so, like, into the history and 
what this like plain brick building, like everything that had gone on there and how, how much depth there was. And if you think about it, like that's what urban decay really stands for. If you think about mm. all the things I said that mattered to me about like makeup, not being superficial about expressing yourself about, you know, like showing your own form of beauty. That is really what those buildings represent buildings that are like crumbling a little, like they're really sort of like got this really unique beauty, not a yeah. flashy beauty um and kooky beauty and there's a lot of story back there there's a lot to tell and so that is really what the name's about i love that oh, it's, and so building over in decay obviously i i'm in terms of beauty if i think of makeup brands or cosmetics brands today urban decay you know is just iconic and yeah we all know that um tell me some of the kind of highlights on the journey of creating urban decay for you I would say highlights were obviously, I don't know, there's so many. I was about to say, it's, it's so like much. just as harsh as like my first question is like, summarize you in a nutshell. I'm like, yeah. summarize Urban Decay, few highlights. I, <laughs> um, you know, I always, I love the product development process so much. Like I always yeah. have, a lot of my stories revolve around those aha moments when it's like, oh my God, I nailed the formula. It's so exciting. Um, I remember that with eyeshadow primer. Um, and you know, at the time I was working with Tim Warner, who's since been insanely successful at drunk elephant and some other places. And he showed me what it meant to like build a hero SKU, right? Like I didn't really know what that was. Um, and he showed me how to do that. And it was cool because that all tied into this like extreme performance. I remember I was wearing, I was trying to create an eye primer that helped my eyeshadow last Mm. And I had this shoot, it was with Sephora and I got a new formulation in. it seemed really nice on the lid. And then I put on this like crazy smoky purple eyeshadow and then I had to go straight to the airport and fly to London. And then the flight was delayed. So I didn't have time to go back to my hotel and I had to go straight to dinner and I get to the restaurant. I'm like, Oh my God, I'm going to look disgusting. And I go in the bathroom and my eye makeup actually is great. And that was like an aha moment when I knew like, oh, I nailed the formula because it lasted through a like 10 hour flight and travel and everything else. And I'm, I'm out to dinner wearing it like hours and hours later. So that was the whole point. And then I had this aha moment and then it like doubled on itself because we marketed the product the right way too. So it was, that was pretty cool to have those, those moments. And then I would also say another aha moment was when Tammy, who was running our PR came up to me and she goes, so Disney called and I'm like, ew, right? <laughs> not ew, but, but you're like, what? Not or what? Day, right? Yeah. He goes, they're, they're doing, um, Alice in Wonderland and Tim Burton is directing. And I'm like, yes, yes, you just yes. knew it. You just knew. Right. Yeah. And we had, we did many other movie tie-ins and the ones that always were the, yes, of course, those are the ones that were successful. And the ones where you really had to like find a way, like, how do we tie this into urban? Like, and you were like kind of massaging the two stories to make them work never sold, you know what I mean? Never really worked. Yeah. So, you know, that's definitely a piece of advice for people is I never say totally listen to your gut because the data doesn't lie either. Right. You have to find some nice balance between those two yeah. things. But with things like that, where you're making a decision about like a collaboration or, or something that's a little less, uh, that's a little more like a gut check. You got to use it. Yeah. It's so true. Now, I, I love that. And especially like, hearing that the product development part like for me also it, it's 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 for us it's it's like giving birth to a, a you know something a product and when you know it's it's always risky and it's scary at times because you don't know how you know disruptive it is how well it's received it's going to be and just seeing people love something you're creating that now even today you know is staying out there for for many years to come it's 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 there's no feeling quite like it um and i'm sure like for you when you saw the reviews coming through as well, that must have been such an incredible feeling just to see people enjoy and love the products. Yeah, so. and I mean, even pre like the era of reviews, it was really exciting to hit the sales team, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I remember when I was a little kid, and this is like people should remember this if you're struggling in your entrepreneurial journey or your creative process, like think about this, right? I always wanted to make something and sell it, right? I always knew like I wanted to make things and I wanted people to buy them. 
And I remember when I was a kid, I like discovered that I like, I liked fire, like lots of kids. Right. And, um, so I would like take drinking straws, which are so awful now that we know, but when I was little, nobody knew. And I would like melt them and make weird little beads out of them and string them onto yarn and make these little necklaces. And they were absolutely horrific, right? So ugly. And I would tell my mom like, Oh, do you think someone would want to buy these? And my mom even said, no, like no one would want to buy them. But I think what's important is like your, your creative journey of making whatever it is you're going to make, it has to start somewhere. Whether you're like a six or a seven year old little girl or an adult person that's starting out on that journey, like, and your first attempt is probably not going to be that great Mm. and that's okay. Right. Just, you got to just keep plugging. And maybe you are one of those genius, brilliant people where your first attempt is great. But Mm. I look back at some of the stuff we did at urban and I'm like, you know, that's people ask me like, I can't believe you don't have any tattoos, right? It's like, because I've got, been through enough graphics to know yeah. I get tired of stuff and sometimes it doesn't age well. Yeah. So um, that's why. And so I just sit, would tell people like, don't give up if you're like attempting and you're not like getting the aesthetic you want. I, I mean, mm-hmm. even with Kelly Ray, Jenna and I talk all the time, like, okay, we've got our brand book. We've got our like inspo boards and all the stuff we did. And we don't feel like, the social's quite there yet. Like we got to keep pushing on it, right. To yeah. get it, the aesthetic and the ideal that we want. And it's this never ending journey and exactly. gotta, like, it's not the destination. It. Yeah. It's yeah. not the destination yeah. at so all. True. No, and, and you hear that a lot with like, and I know you, you say it as well, which I love about sustainability and that's all like, that's like a very common thing, but it's the whole 360 of the business. It's the whole journey. Like you always, I think that's the beauty of it too. You should always be striving to learn, adapt better. Um, and, um, and, and especially, uh, I think we're quite similar to that. If you're a founder, I, I, I like change a lot. I like to keep on moving and uh, I, I also get bored sometimes of things. So I need to like keep on exciting myself. Um, and I do that sometimes with Fable and Main. And sometimes I'm like, I do things that business wise, I'm like, okay, maybe I should just chill a bit. But I'm like, no, let's try it. Let's go. You got to push boundaries. <laughs> so you do have to push boundaries. And then, you know, to balance, you have to have people around you that can balance you though. Because yeah. if you are a like creative person, one, you need like operational and finance people to keep you in line because you have to remember exactly. like you can be creative all day long, but if you uh, run out of money, you run yep. out of money. Like then the exactly. So exactly. Um, I don't want to like, but you know, crush anyone's artistic dreams, but like there's reality out there too. And there's, so you it's balance. Yourself, right. With yeah. those people. And the same yeah. thing, like curate products. Like I would create like piles and piles and piles of products all day long, like stuff mm. that's off the rails. Right. And you need a great like person on your team. Like I have someone who's a great marketer and just go, you know what? We can't do that right now. Here, we got to focus. We got to focus. We got to focus. Because I think sometimes as a founder and entrepreneur, you can get like, it's not that you're not focused and not distracted. Yeah. You get distracted by shiny objects. Exactly. And, 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 And it's about sometimes saying, Okay, it's there. We're not going to say no to it, but it, when? Maybe not today. Maybe in a couple of months' time or a year's time, and and, and maybe by then things have changed, and maybe we'll move, we've moved on. So it's it's actually important to have that. And I think what you said is really important to also remember, like to people building brands, is if you know your strengths and weaknesses, hire people around you and keep them close that can balance those things that you perhaps lack. Right? And yes. For me, don't, um, don't just hire them around you empower them empower them exactly empower them yeah make them feel part of it and make them feel heard and listen because that's why you, that's how you keep them around you too it's very important yeah, it's why you need them you know you yep. hired them for a reason so exactly no i love that so i know so i know uh urban decay sold to l'oreal in 2012 um and then uh, tell us a bit about that journey and then the years up to creating kelly ray Yeah. So that was a really incredible journey. We got to a place with urban where I always tell people it felt like we had so many hits. We're so big in the U S it felt like, it felt like I like band playing these arena rock shows all together. Right. And it was really, really fun. And we needed to expand internationally and it was hard. Like we had an office in France, we had an office in the UK and it was 
it was really like, I don't want to say it was dragging us down, but it was definitely, and it wasn't a distraction, but it was definitely this hard thing to manage with the time zones and the people and the languages. And so for us, we felt like, okay, now's, that was why we made the decision. Like now's the time to really, it's time to work with a strategic partner that can help us take this brand to a whole nother level. And L'Oreal is a great partner for that. They will take mm. your brand to a whole nother yes. stratosphere. They know how to do it. And I think in the years since they acquired us, the 10 years and the other brands they've acquired, they figured out how to do it even better. Exactly. So, um, you know, if that is your goal for your brand, like there's, there's plenty of strategics out there, but they, they're the experience I have and they're great at it. Um, you will, your job changes, you know, like I went from being like super involved in the minutia of their creative to traveling more and being like, you know, that really, truly the face of the brand, which you always are as a founder, but like you're on the road a lot. Um, and we, we showed up with, you know, double digit year over year growth. And, um, it, it was, it was super fun when the sales slow down, you know, they're definitely going to get more involved, so, um, you know, that's just kind of, that was my journey with them. Yeah. And as they got more involved, I found myself less being a creative person and more sitting at a table and critiquing other people's creative work. And I realized like, wow, this isn't what I do. Yeah. And that's and okay. Enjoy. Yeah. Some people love it and they're great at it and they make the creative better and they enjoy it. And I always found myself like, I just start over. You know, like I, I couldn't really comment because I just wanted to create something else. Mm. And um, so, you know, Urban became, I mean, they brought in a great team and they were ready to fly on their own. And I, I definitely love still being involved when they need me. But um, I felt like I needed to go create something else. And so yeah. it was great because I was able to work with L'Oreal and, you yeah. know. And learn from them and the incredible, I'm and sure the boards them. and the structures. And, yeah. And, yeah. And they were very flexible with me, with Callie Ray, and they That's knew really that I was a yeah. creative person. And, you know, so I, I feel like I got really lucky to work with them and yeah. be able to carve out this new niche. It's and so with true. Callie Ray, I just felt like I was traveling the world everywhere, right? Yeah. Germany, Spain, you name it. I was opening countries, opening doors. And everywhere I went, people were asking me about California. You're asking mm. me about like, what's it like there? Do you do yoga? Do you do surf? You know, like, Is everyone vegan? <laughs> it's like, yeah. vegan? Yeah. Um, and it wasn't that everyone was like, oh, I want to pack my bags and move there. But but there is something magical about yeah. California. They that want a taste of it, like, right? A taste of it. It makes you yeah. feel like anything is possible, right? Yeah. I think because of the wellness lifestyle, right? And when you have your health, anything is possible, yeah. right? And so I think it makes people feel like anything is possible. And so I wanted to capture a little bit of that dream because I was the beneficiary of that. Like I'm a girl from Texas who would have never thought in a million years. And I moved to California and I met a cool person and started a brand and like the whole California dream came true for me. And so how do we like package that up for people in their everyday lives? And at the same time, like, there was an important thing at Urban Decay that was completely invisible to the outside world, which was my obsession with wellness. So mm. I'm like a secret full on hippie. I had both my kids at home um, on the floor. Um, and I've always been into like super wellness stuff, my diet, you know, what I eat, everything, like checking all the ingredients. Um, Urban was one of the first brands to take parabens out of all their products. Nobody knows yeah. that because nobody cared wow, back then. Yeah. yeah, nobody cared. And it, it wasn't a thing, right? You couldn't mm. market off of it. I was just like, we shouldn't have parabens in our products. We got to get them out. Mm. Um, we were one of the first brands to start exploring, like, could we start molding components out of a bio-based plastic? Yeah. And um, at the time, it wasn't, it wasn't possible. Um, you ended up actually creating a bigger carbon footprint, but we actually went through the exercise of molding things and seeing if we could do it. And, uh, we had a biodynamic garden that people could pick their lunch in. We had a dog friendly policy so people could have their like little companions with them. We offered yoga. Like we were this super groovy wellness based 
company, but it wasn't really like one of our pillars. So we didn't really talk about it that much. But this has been something that's always really important to me. In fact, we even I even designed the whole office, which was yeah. an expansive like four building campus, um, to be all made out of all non afgassing materials. So the indoor air quality was really good. We had plants in all the buildings so that the indoor air quality was really good. Um, so all of that was really important to me. And so I thought, well, if I'm going to do another brand, like that's going to be an important front and center pillar because it's important to me. Yes. So. So I'm going to put it out front. And that's what we did with Cali Ray. And then with the other piece of it, with the sustainability, I was on a surf trip with my family. We were yeah. out in the middle of nowhere. And, you know, my boys were out ripping it up. I'm exhausted. And I'm like, I'm going to go into the beach and hang out. And I get onto this deserted island where we're surfing. And I park my board, sit down, and I'm going to take a hike through the, through the little jungle. And I can't because it's filled with plastic trash. Out in the middle of nowhere. Of nowhere, yeah. And I thought to myself, like, this is really bad. Like, I probably, like, there's probably a lot of naked pallets in landfills. Yeah. Like, what's, so, you know, what's the mission now? Like, the mission before was to sort of change people's perspective on who was beautiful and what beauty Mm -hmm. meant. And now I feel like the perspective should be like, hey, how can we lead this industry? Because, you know, I always love, Jenna always says, like, well, people aren't going to just start putting avocado on their face or in their hair, right? They're going to mm-hmm. they're going to put products. So how can we create products that have the least impact? How can we um, work as a community and learn and teach each other how to make more sustainable things or things that are less harmful to the environment? And yeah. we're just starting out. And I think what's cool about the sustainability space is yeah. – the road is so wide open. Like there's so much we can do now and there's so much more we will be able to do and we will be able to do more and more and more if more brands participate, which is exactly amazing. Is well, and, and you know what I love is how not only like you have your key pillars and you, you, you're very sure of what you want to create here with Caddy Ray, but you're also having fun on the journey as well and making it really just, I think, connective with people. I love when I was going to your website, you have like sexy sustainability. Um, and I, I think yeah. I was seeing, it was like your, your name was like Khaleesi, like the queen, like, is it like oh, yeah. Game of Thrones? <laughs> right. I thought that was like, dude, do you watch Game of Thrones? I'm assuming. Oh yeah. That's what yeah. My, my, oh look, <laughs> this is what he gave me for my birthday. Oh, Khaleesi. I love that. And I was yeah. like, but that is exactly, and then I, I know uh, Jenna. What was hers? Um, the vibe, the vibologist, vibologist. Yeah. And I thought that was so cool, um, and it was like really big. So it was like it was like a nice way to like. For me, when I went there, I was like, I also understood in a word what kind of vibe are both of you guys, right? So I think it's really important when creating brands today is how do you connect with your audience and just. Uh, obviously like have your pillars and everything but just go a bit more personal i think that's what cali ray is for me um and and do you feel that's something that you from day one were like i'm not gonna sacrifice that that's exactly what i want to build yeah i we wanted to build something sustainable and obviously you have to make choices yeah um but we did we wanted to be something more than just a brand we wanted it to be like a little portal you could jump into yeah. Um, I think you said it earlier, like it's the love letter to California. How do you jump into that? Exactly. Yeah. And um, so that's that's why we created the brand. And that's why we love it. And we live in it because it's who we are. And so it's very yeah. easy because, it's you know, I know people throw around the word authenticity and I kind of don't yeah. like it. It's overused. Yeah. Um, but but you have to like live it. That's why we're like based in a beach house. Yeah, exactly. You know? and you, yeah. When you live and breathe the brand, uh, it. It, it is truly, uh, you connect with so many. But so can you tell us a little bit about, because um, I know you have a, a, some, a, you have a, you launched about 2020, correct? Uh, the brand? The brand, yeah. Oh, no, we launched, um, we probably sold our first, well, we launched October of 2021 on our own website, but it was tiny, it was a soft ah, launch. Yeah, okay. so we've, we've really been in Sephora since January of 22. That was really our kind of launch focus. Wow. And so um, we've really been in business about eight months. Okay, wow, amazing. Okay, so, so, so but you created, when, when was the idea first created? 
Um, probably 2020. Yeah. 2020. So yeah. So 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 this is really cool because it's it's the it's a pandemic born band truly right so is that something that like how did you navigate the the moments of lockdown and creating this well I think it actually helped in this case because mm. um you know we well one number one in California we could be outside a lot yeah um and so that. we could meet outside um Jen and I spent a lot of time you know on the beach mm -hmm. at my house with like I have a house that opens up and it's like living outside sitting outside in the backyard so we were able to connect um both on zoom and outside and because there was downtime right you weren't distracted mm -hmm. by like oh I got this thing to go to I got that thing to go to like this was our like pandemic hobby I know some people learn to play the guitar and some people learn to speak Spanish well we built a brand. So that was what we did. Um, my friend Helen went and got her master's in public policy, which I was like, well, that's more than what I did. <laughs> like you do you. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, but that's that. super cool. Like, you know, people took that pandemic time it's and they, true. they made it productive and that's what we tried to do as well. Exactly. So, um, that's and I think cool. one of the things we learned coming out of the pandemic, right. It was such a hard time for everybody, hmm. um, to be isolated, to be, to just not have like all of the like people in life. And we realized how much we need that from each other and how much joy we need in our lives. And I think one exactly. of the things Jen and I realized as we were building the brand is the whole sustainability piece. It can mm -hmm. be kind of gloom and doom, yeah. right? It can feel a little onerous if you're not deep into it. It's like, God, oh, do I really want to read that article about that giant yeah. iceberg that just fell off and it's going to raise sea levels and now we're not going to have enough water. And, so our whole goal is to like, how can we make this an easy step for people to participate in the sustainability journey? And I think how, exactly that easy, right? Because there can be can so many easy. words. Yeah. Yes. How can we make it joyful? It's like, here's your mascara. It works great. And it's made out of ocean plastic. Feel exactly. good about it. Yeah. Maybe that person, because they now feel good about that choice, maybe they take another little step deeper into something else they could do. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, we always, we want to be like the gateway drug to sustainability. And I think what you're, and you say on the website, again, you say sustainability is attitude and action. I think that's the thing that a lot of people miss in their sustainability conversation is they focus on the action, but not the attitude. And the attitude is the way to connect with people to want to learn more about it. Right. right. And I think that's exactly it. So I mean, now I'm hearing what you're saying. I'm like, oh, that. It totally makes sense. Yeah, we're each other's influencers. Exactly. So. Yeah, exactly. Um, so tell us about the product portfolio today and what people can find on Calirae, you know, com, but also in Sephora today. Yeah, Calirae so we have everything on Sephora and Calirae, um, other than you can buy some candles and some merch on com that you can't buy on yeah. Sephora. Yeah. Um, but we, we launched with our uh, mascara. It's a tubing mascara. It just won the Allure Best of Beauty Award, which Congrats. really our That's first huge. round. Thank you. That's amazing. For your first year, pretty much as well. But yeah, like, literally like the first year you could win it. You won yeah. it. That's insane. Um, and so it's an awesome tubing mascara. It's inspired mm -hmm. by my love of surfing and also all of the women I have met along the way of my beauty journey who have told me like, I want volume and I don't want panda eyes at the end of the day. And I was like, well, how are we going to do this? They don't want to wear waterproof because it's hard on your lashes. Mm -hmm. So, and tubing mascaras in the past hadn't really performed. So I set out to like work on this tubing mascara that would give you that long wear, zero smudge performance mm -hmm. and also be clean and also come in a sustainable package. Yeah. So. And, and you have a travel size too, which I love. I, I saw at the, at the Beauty on the Fly as well in, in Sephora. And I was like, that's pretty cool. You, you know, when you, um, when you made a cult product, when you get the Beauty on the Fly placement and a mini version of a, oh, of a product. Yeah especially so early on. So I know that's a, it's a good formula. And I already, I remember seeing like online all your reviews were like five, pretty much, I couldn't see anything lower than five stars. So, you know, oh. it's a good product. Uh, well, you know, mascara is a personal item. So I think yeah. if you have a mascara that's four stars or above, you're crushing it exactly. because, um, yeah. you know, everyone's lashes are different and there's so many different lengths, textures, straight, curly. So it's hard to have one thing that pleases all people. So I think, um, yeah, anybody out there that's got a mascara over four stars, you deserve a hand. You do, yeah. That's um, so true. And if you get an Allure Award as well. Oh, cool. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
And then we've got pencils, um, yep. our surfproof pencils. These are clean. They are made with over 65% bioplastic in the barrels. So again, these aren't an ideal product in terms of sustainability because you do sharpen them away. The, the, the sharpenings are not recyclable. We try to be really transparent and tell people that. Um, and the caps are made with virgin plastic. Our manufacturer isn't really ready to go to PCR in the caps because they feel like they can't get the right seal and then the pencils will dry out. So this is something we're working on, right? We have to be totally transparent and tell people, I'm not going to tell you my pencil's perfect, but we're working on it. We're trying to get there. Exactly. Um, going back to your point, it's journey, right? Journey. Uh, we also have a skin tint. I love this skin tint because it's really flexible on all kinds of undertones and shades. Um, I, can, I, I have a friend. Um, he actually works in stores for us. And um, he's very different skin tone than me, but we wear the same skin tint shade. And it looks great on both of us. And I think it's cool because what I tried to do was create something that had like a natural blurring effect to soften yeah. everything out and a lightweight pigment and a lightweight texture that's really hydrating on the skin. So you mm -hmm. get that like really beautiful finish polished look without a lot of coverage. So your skin shines through and yeah. that's really the idea behind it. And that is also in a package that is over 75% ocean plastic. So mm -hmm. another one you can feel pretty good about. And we have a uh, plumping lip gloss that's got no burn. It's really glossy. It's like an oil balm, but glossy like a gloss and has a high level of maxi lips. So it does plump over time. So use it for 30 days and you'll see a like extended, you know, plump. Um, but it does plump immediately with like agents that don't burn. So that's kind of cool too. Um, and that comes in a bioplastic sugarcane based tube with a cap that's almost 100% post consumer recycled plastic, just a little bit that isn't. Um, yeah. And then our new like big hit is our primer, our so blown yeah. primer. It's done really well. And I think people love it because it really does blur out all your fine lines and all your pores. But unlike many blurring primers, it's super lightweight, so it doesn't feel heavy or spackly. It feels like a like lightweight, fresh hydrator. It's got niacinamide in it. It's got collagen peptides. So it feels like you're treating your skin, and yet your skin looks really blown out and beautiful. I went to Sephora yesterday, and I, I literally tried it on, and I couldn't stop touching my hand. The texture yeah, it makes it was... so soft, right? I, I yeah. was, like, really confused. I was like, is this, like, powder on me? It was so soft. Yeah, it it's got perfecting powders in it, and but yeah. really, it doesn't feel heavy. It feels really lightweight. No, it's super lightweight. Yeah, it's amazing. Very, very cool. Um, so yeah, and then in terms of like kind of the long, like the future, is it just kind of staying? Because I know you say beauty, body, wellness. Is it um, kind of expanding into more categories? Is it kind of owning the cosmetics and color yeah, space? So yeah, our focus is on makeup. That's my expertise. But yeah. we, I am really into the wellness piece. I love my supplements. Yeah. I'm really into them. So I have a great partner. We're working on some wellness aspects to the brand that we're really right. excited about. And we have a lot of new things coming for 2023 that I think people will be really excited about as well. That's so exciting. And then, of course, just, you know, focusing with Sephora and growing with them. They're an amazing partner to have, as we know. But there's a partner. lot of work, a lot of work and a lot of, you know, Tunnel vision as well sometimes because you can do so much just in Sephora, right? And that's, yeah, that's very important. It's, Education, it's a, field stuff. It takes a lot to be a partner with Sephora. Lot. Anybody who's a founder should know it's not like, oh, it's I just easy. go up and turn it on and I've got sales. Like, no. you, they're great yep. partners and they, they're great incubators of new brands. They're great supporters of founders, but you have to pull your weight. You have to pull your weight. And, and you have to know, like, you know, is it, it's, there can be a game of rankings and you know new brands come and you can never be comfortable you have to always be pushing making relationships both with your merchants your store your staff you know everyone it, it's a it's it's really again like like everything it's a journey and it, it never stops so yeah. yeah it's a lot of people say Sephora is a dream and it is but make sure you're prepared for that journey uh, and then yeah, that. and I will tell you, I how long have I done this? How long have I been in this yeah. industry? How long have I been a partner with Sephora since they began, right? Exactly. And even I didn't have the team I needed on board when I started. Mm -hmm. Like, even I underestimated what I would need. So, yeah. and the thing to remember is the world is like 
changing so fast that what you needed and you could advise someone to start off with might be completely different today. The focus might be different. And, you know, I look back and when Sephora came to the U.S., like none of the big brands, you know, none of the big strategics wanted to put their brands into Sephora. They were a department yeah. store. So, so I had like 12 nail polishes, 10 lipsticks and like 15 eyeshadows. That was my line. Right. Yeah. And Sephora was like, here's your three big gondola. And I was like, what am I going to do with that? And they're like, yeah, we'll space it all out, I guess. And so can you imagine now? Can you yeah. imagine you have a like? you know, 30 skew line. And they're like, here's your three big gondola. Like, it's just, you know, it's laughable. Yeah. So um, the world has changed a lot yeah. since I started. Um, but just, you know, really make sure you have your resources in place to get going that I'm not telling you to overspend to take on things you can't take on as a brand, but really look at what you're going to need and figure yeah. it out. Like get resourceful, get scrappy, figure yeah. it out. Very, very true. And I, and I think, uh, you know, don't be afraid, especially anyone starting a brand or about to go into retail, um, you know, message and reach out to founders um, that have maybe done the journey because a lot of even just the power of a message or a call can really change a lot of decision making and, and understand what kind of brand you're building is right for what kind of retailer or, you know, or an, yeah. an end and consumer. You know, you know, like you're the founder and you have to like, inspire people but you also have to just like get your hands dirty too yeah yeah and not be afraid of it yeah no, and, I mean, and, and and many years into creating the brand it. you know this it's, it's never going to stop them sometimes until you maybe if you want to and you have the luxury of choosing not to that's a different story but generally speaking it's it's a it's, you always have to you always yeah. have to you always have i'm to. like i pack boxes all the time just yeah. saying still you know, I, I was uh, like uh, one thing I started doing, which is which is actually a really big um, uh, something I, I want to start. I might, might do a TikTok on it. I, I, invite, I think all founders should do this. I was I was at an industry event yesterday, um, and I was like, every time I, people ask for the business cards, and I and I always say, oh, let's go digital, and you know, I don't want to like print stuff and whatever. Then I was like, but then also people always ask me, like, I would love to, I'll try your brand. I want to try it. And then I always end up saying, oh, like, I'll send you something or yeah, like, and it gets complicated. And I thought, carry a bunch of like my deluxe samples, right? Like my five mLs, my mini oils. And I printed, I, I literally did it on like Photoshop. I printed and I cut the same type of label I put on it, but I just put my QR code and my business, right. my details. Oh, awesome. And I, I was gluing them before the event, even at the event, and I was giving them around to everyone and the mini oils. And I was like, it's such a, yeah, it was such a nice way to like get people to try your product, but also like, that's my email. <laughs> that's my data. <laughs> so yeah, that that's something. A, I have mini mascaras. I'm going to put my personal like business. Do it. To, I Honestly. Love it. I it's love it. And like halfway through the event, I was like, printing it because i ran out and i was making more because uh, i had some cut out labels already and then people were looking at it and i was like don't bother me i'm just uh, making some more there business cards right <laughs> literally and literally yeah. someone said to me i was like i was like oh i used to be an artist i used to love painting this is like my joy so yeah you have to just uh yeah pack boxes do things whatever you just never stop it's important to keep it keep it playful it's very important um so before we go into fire round questions um i have I'm a sort so of scared of fire round questions always like i, I always, know mine, I mine are pretty across, nice I though i only want to come across as clever and smart and i always <laughs> want to be nice. and i purposely like don't really send it to guests beforehand so like, i always get the authentic response um but yeah before i go into that I, I have a desert island situation definitely hopefully not the desert island that you went to in your surf trip it's going to be a, a nice founded beauty retreat um and but i'm being very strict and tsa is saying look wendy you can only bring one cali ray product with you so what is your go-to right now hmm. i'd have to bring that so blown primer i think yeah i do why just because, because it makes my skin look amazing you know what yeah. maybe i'll bring the skin tint i think the skin tints even you know like just Fine. I, you can bring both. I'll let you bring both. I'll let you bring right. both because like, you need them together. They, together. The, the, the dream it's, combo, exactly. Yeah. Um, but I was also going to say, like that mascara will be pretty, pretty needed, right? Because you'll have like the beach and it's water. Like you'll, st you know, it's a, yeah. all your product. Are you going to do um, like a, a like? Well, I don't know if it's needed because but mini kits and stuff, um, like discovery sets. I love a discovery set personally. Um, yeah. So I think we may have to do that. 
Definitely. But I think that Sephora as well, it's one of the best things like we've seen is like, it's such a, like a lot of the consumers are just looking to trial before they purchase. And of course the minis of certain SKUs and Beauty on the Fly is great, but like we're seeing like recently our second performing SKU was our discovery set. Like, and it was quite confusing. We were like, whoa, what's happening yeah. here? So people are really interested in it now, that which is, is really cool, which is good. Okay. Yeah. Your, uh, your favorite moment's coming up now, okay. fire round. <laughs> so my first question is, what's another beauty brand that you're currently loving? I currently love Gwen's beauty brand. Yeah? Um, I I worked I've with seen her. it. I haven't, yeah. yeah. Is it good? So I worked with her on an Urban Decay collab with her, and <laughs> it was really, she's a wonderful person and really lovely, and the thing she wanted more than anything was to have her own beauty brand. And mm. it came out, and then I have been using the priming oil, I've been using her lip, it's, it's, it's really nice. It's great. I know that we touched, I love that because, I, I again, I love... Uh, all types of founders, as long as they come in with a very kind of true reason to create it and, you know, not just create it and then give up and then this is a waste. But uh, a lot of celebrities obviously are creating brands today. But I love hearing that story because it makes me feel like she's definitely like always been curious about creating a brand. She even tested the concept through collaborating with, you know, right. Urban Decay, uh, figuring and then taking time before launching her own. And you can really see it as a consumer, as a viewer, as an industry lover. Like I can see when she launched the brand, it, there was such um, like a, a love and, and but also time was spent on it. It wasn't a quick rushed project because obviously you don't launch that way in a quick way. So, yeah, yeah I don't see you need partners always, with you. She's always it. been yeah. a makeup person. Yeah. And it's not, she's not faking it. She's not like, oh, I'm famous, so I'm going to make a beauty brand. I like, put my name on it. Yeah, this I is real. Think, I think she would have been, uh, if she hadn't been Gwen, she would have been a beauty entrepreneur. That's amazing. And now yeah. she is, which is awesome. Um, what is a guilty pleasure of yours? Oh, so you're going to think this is really silly. But my husband and I, um, we don't hydrate enough. And so when we take a moment and have like an evening on the couch to, you know, like watch our Game of Thrones or the new show, yeah. right? Whatever Ash it is. Dragons, yeah. um, so we eat like six Pedialyte pops each. Really? Yes. Because they're hydrating so and they're sweet and they're cold. And like, so we sit on the couch and eat popsicles and together. And that. Love that. Yeah. But six. I love how specific that is. So sometimes is it even more than that? Uh, well, <laughs> that I'm at six it. between us. So yes, it can be maybe eight, maybe go yeah. to four. I love that. I love that. That is so cool. Um, so what are you currently watching or reading? So I'm currently watching... Um, I'm currently watching the Game of Thrones thing. House of Dragons. Of Dragons. Yep. Super Khaleesi. cool. Which is perfect for you because it's all perfect about Khaleesi. No. And I'm reading a book by Terry Real called Us. I'm uh, On Sunday, I celebrate my 23rd wedding anniversary. Oh, and um, this is a book about marriage. And yeah. um, I love always trying to like up our game. So I I'm reading that. it right now. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, do you have like a favorite social media platform right now? Well, I'm supposed to be on TikTok, but I haven't done it yet. I mean, don't rush. I mean, like it's such a, it's amazing, but it's such a time waster. Um, so. I don't really love social. I probably mm -hmm. shouldn't admit that. I, I do love communicating with people. Yeah. But I, like I went to a dinner on Wednesday night and I was so happy. I was so happy just to like, enjoy and connect with people in person i'm yeah. kind of old school because i've been around the block you know no, so but also I, like i think i think it is so fatiguing like i mean i i'm coming from a place where i literally like i i ran social media for uh dior and Estee Lord. like that was my job when i was in corporate world um i think also by doing that for so long you naturally would get fatigued but i'm only on it right now just for the, the business part and obviously like um the connection part with people I wouldn't necessarily meet all the time, but like just connect virtually. But generally speaking, I'm like quite over it, which uh, it's, I think it's absolutely normal. And I think actually I'm glad I am because it's, it can be such a time waster and distractor, but yeah. it, it's important to, to still use and, and, and but mindfully consume it. You know what I mean? That's so it's important. It's really to hard. And it, yeah. it, I get a little freaked out because, you know, there's so much misinformation 
And I have people I love who are affected by a lot of that misinformation. And so, I don't know. I just don't love it. Yeah, I completely agree. My, my next question is, do you have a favorite quote or mantra? Um, I have a more of like a mantra, which mm-hmm. is, uh, it's, I just tell myself like, balance is a dynamic state. And so I always remind myself that you have to be searching for the balance, but it's not about finding balance and parking it. It's yeah. about finding balance and then remembering like it's a dynamic state and you've got to like always be looking to make sure that that balance stays in line, whether it's family, work, anything else you're doing. Um, mm-hmm. And then, you know, in work, my mantra is like, where's the perfect balance again between art and commerce like how do i create a product that like speaks to people and like moves their soul artistically and then how do i mesh that with enough commerce to make it a saleable viable product love that that is so true and and i think that's exactly what uh i think is missing a bit is there's not many brands and products that well that do that or even effectively do that in my way. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, and I know you're in the lightning round, but this is like, uh, I think a really important thing for uh, entrepreneurs to remember and founders to remember is that, you know, especially in beauty, yeah, it's packaged goods. It's not fashion. Okay. Exactly. It's, it's packaged goods. So it's not unlike your Tide detergent, right? If you like Tide and I'm only using that, not, I know it's not a wellness brand, right? But if you yeah. like Tide and it works for you, you will go back and you will buy it and you use it up. And you will Mm -hmm. buy it again. Beauty is not unlike that in that you like it, you use it up and you buy it again. But you have to remember, that's why the art piece is so important. Because unlike your dishwashing detergent, your laundry detergent, and your soap, your hand soap, maybe hand soap is beauty. Um, It has to have, you have to have an emotional connection to that product. It's not only about performance. So that's why that art commerce thing is so important because you have to create the emotional connection, but you also mm-hmm. have to run it like a business, right? Yeah, you have to exactly. run it like a package business. So yeah. that's why the beauty industry is so interesting because it is not fashion and yeah. it is not packaged goods. It is this weird hybrid in between. And it's exact, you know, it's not, it's like those items you were saying that like they're sort of essential items, which is why you, you, you go back and, you know, you, you, you repeat and purchase with beauty it is that bridge between they're like desirable and semi partly essential but not fully really essential right so that love created with the art form for example is is critical to keep long term because also then you have a lot of newness and then that desire part comes out more right because oh i'm i'm, I'm intrigued i i have this amazing shampoo but it's not essential i stick to that one it's not essential i really have it but i'm intrigued by this new thing so if you don't also evolve in your art and keep on you know connecting it is you, about you, constant you, evolution akash you won't have loyalty constant. and you've seen that when you built urban decay right you've seen the journey and um but also what I love is in building Cali Ray is you probably saw something that it was where the industry was moving even more towards. And it's hard to sometimes it's such a big, big brand and it doesn't need to keep on moving to another thing. But sometimes you have to create another brand to, to do that. Right. It's hard to turn a big ship. You can't. Sure. You can't. And, 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 and I actually like it's, it's, it's one of the reasons when I left the corporate world, you know, I was in bed with the El- Estee Lauder's LVMH and, and my last job was at Dior. And I had a career there and I was always considering myself an entrepreneur. Like I, with, with my CEO, I, I was building new things that wasn't there at Deal before. And I was very fulfilled by that because I felt I was changing the company. But then I realized there's still uh, a lot I want to see in the industry. And sometimes I didn't felt it was even right to say Dior should do that, right? For example, just even inclusivity. Like I thought my dream was, I was in boardroom meetings and I was like, we don't have a person of color on our face yet. You know, you think of Dior, you have like Kari De Levine, Bella Hadid, uh, all, the, all the faces are not one person of color. And I was always the one championing it. And I thought, but you know what? Like, I don't know. Like, I get it, right? 60, 70% of the business is in China. Like, you know, you have to think about a global brand and a global face. And it, it is what it is. It's French luxury, savoir faire. Like, maybe it's okay for me to not force that, but maybe I, I'll create another brand that is that, right? And, and maybe I can inspire the industry through my brand. And then that's when I started thinking about 
the barriers to entry to create a business are a bit lower today. Um, their retailer is really putting their money and betting and giving space where they might not get the productivity and the revenue in a small brand yet, but they're hoping that they can become one. And that kind of inspired me to jump ship and say, I'm not ready yet, but I'll figure it out. Let me create Fable and Main. Yeah, and you learn on the journey. Yeah. You learn on the journey. That's a great story. So, yeah. Well, my last question is, um, if you weren't a beauty entrepreneur or in the beauty biz, what would Wendy be doing right now? Oh, I think I'd like to be a painter. Yeah. And, um, I mean, if, if physical limits weren't a problem, I'd like to be, uh, a professional surfer. Yeah. Or that's the... I'd like to be a professional athlete, but so I've cool. never been that gifted. I love sports. I love to use my body. I love to play outside, but yeah. I don't have the, like, I don't have that gift. But um, you know, the best thing is, is you still can do it for you. And yeah, maybe really not compete and get the medals, that. but for you, yeah. you still go surfing, right? And that's the best thing. Yeah, I'm going tomorrow. Amazing. Well, I, next time when I, I'm going to, I'm going to come to Cali Ray house, I'm going to, we're going to go surfing. I am, I always joke with my friends because a lot of my friends are actually really good surfers in, in England and stuff. And then they, I always like pretend like they, they like there's a thing called kooks, right? Like, which are like, oh, um, yeah, yeah kooks. And I, and I, I I'm called Kook Slams. You should check it out. I already have. Yeah, I, I already know. Oh, okay. <laughs> I know the Kooks of the day. My friends, and basically I've been only surfing twice, but I will say in my proud, humble self that I'm a pretty natural, <laughs> but, but, but I'm only on twice, so I'm probably really bad. But I got up every time and I, I, um, I, and, I feel know, like... And you know, I have a friend and she has a surf, she's a, a surf camp for women. Um, yeah. She's just women to surf and it's called Surf Diva. And she said, the best surfer in the water is the one who's having the most fun. So, Love that. So yeah. on that note, then when I come next time and we go surfing, as long as I'm having fun, I won't be able to keep We're gonna up. We're going to go to a great spot that's perfect. And um, maybe I'll drag one of my boys along. They coach surf camp all summer long. So Okay, good. They, then I can feel a bit. Yeah. Okay, they, I can get some yeah. training. Amazing. Well, where can everyone follow you? And of course, Kelly Ray um, um, and find the website. What's all the links? And I'll... So my Instagram is Wendy Zomner and my Facebook pages as well. My, um, twi- my TikTok, which doesn't have any creative up yet, but I swear I'm going to do it. Bobby Brown tells me I need to do it. So to do it. I'm I mean, she's an amazing job with she's amazing doing, at it. Yeah. Right. She's yeah. like, you got to do it. Um, anyway, so my TikTok is Zominatrix. When it mm. when it does happen, that's where I'll be. Amazing. And um, that's it. Yeah, and you can buy it at Sephora or on kellyraybeauty.com. I'll put all the links in the summary so people can go tap straight yeah. away. And um, Wendy, it's been an absolute pleasure. And this is just the beginning of our friendship. And I'm going to come. We're going to go surfing. And um, we're going to, yeah, you're going to show me um, Newport Beach. And the fun fact is probably, I shouldn't admit it, but um, I was, I, I, I know we were meant to record in person today. So I'm, I'm in LA traffic and next time I'll come. But um, when I saw Newport Beach, I recently, that day I was, um, I finished selling OC. And I was watching oh, yeah. the, and then there was all a whole thing about Newport Beach. And I was like, Newport Beach. And then suddenly uh, the email came through and it was like, you know, you can record in Calorie House in Newport Beach. And I was like, wait, I just saw this in Selling OC. Yeah. And, and I say this, right, because I'm from London, right? So I don't know California too well, but I know um, it's a, an amazing area. Yeah. yeah, it's amazing. Where I, I have kind of a fun story. So where I live, it's down and I call it the ghetto of Newport Beach. It's like a little <laughs> surf land. There's usually like... Some guy in my driveway changing into his wetsuit, you know, like a little surf yeah. land down here. Um, there's some very fancier parts of Newport, which is really where you saw, like, selling the, the OC. Selling OC, yeah. yeah. Um, but I actually, so I was getting a ride home from someone and the, this guy and his wife, and I'm giving him directions back to my house. And we're driving down the hill, and she's like where are we? And I said, Oh, well, I, you know, we're in Newport. She goes, Oh, I've never been to this part of Newport before. And I was like, clutch your pearls, sister. It's going to be okay. You're going to be fine. I love it. That is so funny. But I, that's just, it just shows. I mean, it, it, I think that the, I love, especially like the surfer community as well. Like it's just, it's, I'm sure it's like, it's just, it's not about the 
It's just about it's, the waves no here. and the, it's, and like, the people. That's what I love about it. It's not, there's no gates here. There's I no... love that it's a really, like, I live in a place, like, people are Community. coming in, all different kinds of people. Yeah. It's, um, I, will, I will never say Newport Beach is a diverse place, <laughs> but it's as diverse as you can get down here at the beach because it yeah. calls all kinds of people. And well, when people connect, well, on, not on this and that, it's on the waves, right? It's like the when, waves, they, when there's a the day with good waves, waves everyone's sure. there. Playing beach volleyball or whatever it is, we like, you know, it's it's about the connection of being outside and being able to just walk right onto the sand and, you know, it's oh, just a very, and I like to ride my bike places. I ride my bike all around. Um, so. Amazing. Oh, well, okay. Well, I'm going to be, very, I'll be there very, very soon. Surf. Yeah. We're gonna, like, you can even stay. Akash, you know, we have a, we have a guest bedroom here at the Cali Ray house. Why don't you stay? I would, I would love that. Uh, let's definitely do that next time. That'd be amazing. Okay. I'll, I'll make sure I'll, I'll stay for a longer, uh, cause I'm actually, yeah, I might even move to LA for a few months. If I do, then I'll, I'll come down some one time. And, uh, uh, that'd be amazing. Yeah.